good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I think. So welcome uh, here uh, to the University of Poitiers uh, on the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities campus. Um, and uh, we know we have people in the room here. We have also people uh, online, so welcome to all. Uh, my name is Ludovic Tilly. I'm uh, the Vice Director for the EC2 Alliance uh, European Networks at the University of Poitiers, and I'm coordinating uh, both the EC2 Alliance and the RI4C2 project, which is the topic of this event today uh, and tomorrow. So it's a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you to this opening uh, uh, session where we will have uh, several uh, interventions and we will immediately start with uh, our director of the University of Poitiers, Virginie Laval, who is also a professor in psychology. So uh, Virginie, please, the, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues from the EC2U Alliance, dear representative of the European Commission, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Poitiers, founded in 1431. Welcome to our city university. Among uh, our many prestigious alumni, let me just cite René Descartes, the famous mathematician, physicist, and philosopher who graduated from the law faculty in 1616. Descartes is the perfect example of an enlightened and multidisciplinary scientist. We are meeting today in the recently renovated building called La Ruche, the Beehive, located on our social sciences and humanities campus. The name of this building is very appropriate as it has been conceived as a multi-purpose facility that includes a library and different spaces that fav favor collegial work among students and academic staff. The Beehive is also at the image of our alliance, the European Campus of cities, City Universities, EC2U. The foundations of the EC2U vision are related to the university in the city concept as a humanistic, citizen-centered, and sustainable model of collaborative actions. The EC2U model defines university, universities as central actors of the knowledge square composed of education, research, innovation, and service to society. This model establishes sustainability and quality as basic requirements for a responsible university. As an heritage, of the Poitiers Declaration lunch 2016 during the annual meeting of the Coimbra Group in Poitiers, and jointly signed by University Rector and City Mayors, the EC2U model reasserts that ID that universities play a central role in the development of cities, which in turn represent a fundamental framework and our catalyst for universities' development. Cities and universities have a common and vital interest in the development of education and knowledge. The EC2U Alliance aims at planning a shaping role within its ecosystem at all levels, municipalities, large urban areas, regional, national, on European territories. The University of Poitiers is particularly proud to coordinate the EC2U Alliance on the reason of the present two-day events is the end of the sister project of the EC2U Alliance, the Horizon 2020 project called Research and Innovation for Cities and Citizens. Her I4C2. This project was 
also coordinated by the University of Poitiers and composed out of all the initial ECTU member universities. University of Coimbra, Portugal, University of Viache, Romania, University of Jena, Germany, University of Pavia, Italy, University of Poitiers, France, University of Salamanca, Spain, University of Turku, Finland. In the meantime, the ECTU Alliance welcomed the University of Linz, Australia, Austria, who also informally participated to some of the activities in the RE4, NRE4 C2 uh, project. What's this project? Well, first, this uh, always, always 2020 project has been awarded a 2 million euros grant in 2021 in complement to the Erasmus Plus funding that help us creating the EC2U Alliance. Second, this project is rooted in several important recent initiatives supported by the European Commission and related to the support to researchers, the development of open science and citizen science the cooperation between academic and non-academic actors among many other important topics. In this project, the EC2U partners have joined forces to create a chair pan-European knowledge ecosystem. The project has developed a process that involved a gradual and adaptive transformation of all aspects of the research and innovation missions at our universities. The project was based on eight work packages that acted as engines that strengthened the local knowledge ecosystem at each EC2U university and connected them together to create a pan-European knowledge ecosystem. During the, these two days, the program will work you through all the achievements of the Herai 4C2 project with presentation of the concrete tool, tools and policies that were jointly developed and, and at the end of the event, we will be in capacity to officially launch our EC2U pan-European knowledge ecosystem. So, dear EC2U colleagues and friends, dear participants, I wish you a great closing event of the Herai 4C2 project, which legacy will continue to fertilize the new development phase of the EC2U Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Rector. It's not indeed an easy exercise uh, to use all these acronyms, uh, so we will probably practice all together at some point. But thank you very much, uh, dear Virginie. It's my great pleasure now to introduce you to uh, Yves Gervais, who is a professor also in, uh, in Poitiers. Uh, and uh, uh, Yves Gervais is the Vice Rector for Research. So please, Yves. Thank you very much, Ludovic, for the introduction. OK, um, just a few words. I, I don't want to be long. Dear colleagues, dear participants, so after this uh, general presentation that has been given by our rector, Virginie Laval, uh, just want to, uh, to add some elements regarding the relevance of the work proper within the RI4C2 project. Excuse me with RI4C2. It's not easy for, for us. <laughs> So in this context of the EC2U Alliance, as it has been said, the main objective of the RI4C2 project was to extend the activities of EC2U to the research and innovation fields and to create a pan-European knowledge of ecosystem. As it's going to be presented more in details during these two days, we worked together to develop the common research and innovation agenda 
including the creation of new virtual institutes, to strengthen our human capital by supporting research careers and encouraging gender equality in research, that's important, to share our research infrastructure, infrastructure structures, excuse me, and resources, to reinforce our cooperation with non-academic actors, to mainstream open science, and to promote citizen science. So it's a very large and very important program. Let me just take one example where I have been myself directly involved. In order to develop our common ECTU research agenda, all vice rectors for research met on several occasions to discuss our individual strengths and identify common topics of interest, where our ECTU framework could be a game changer in terms of solving societal challenges. We then decided to complement our initial three sustainable development goals, which are health and well-being, quality education, sustainable cities and communities, by four additional LDG, SDGs, or transversal topics if you prefer, which are peace, justice, and strong institutions, education, sciences, life on land, and materials and methods for a sustainable future. We will now have, we will now have seven active virtual institutes, and soon eight virtual institutes, hosting international interdisciplinary teams of students, teachers, researchers, and innovators from the EC2U's Alliance. They will foster the rapid integration of research results and evaluation into education via, in, via new challenge-based curricula, as well as a diversity of short-term trainings, such as internships, summers, or winter schools, etc. These knowledge-creating teams will also deliver innovative solutions to local, national, European, and global challenges via a mission-oriented approach. So you will see that the RI4C2 project is going to lead to concrete results that will last in the EC2U Alliance. Also, during this event in Poitiers, you will have the opportunity to have a full overview of the tools, strategies, and policies developed during the past three years. So, dear colleagues, dear participants, I hope you will enjoy the closing event of the RI4C2 project, and I thank you for your, your attention. So now it will be my turn to speak, and I uh, didn't want to uh, repeat what has been already uh, explained in terms of the, the general objectives of the RI4C2 project, as well as some concrete examples, such as the virtual institutes, as both rectors and vice rector, rector and vice rector has just explained. I wanted actually to take another approach, which is to somehow um, present to you uh, some of our latest reflections on why have we started this whole concept of the C2U Alliance, and in particular, how the RI4C2 project has been uh, uh, created, submitted, and implemented. So for this, um, I will use, uh, as you can see uh, now, uh, another uh, presentation that will actually somehow be uh, presented in two, two parts. One will be at this uh, opening uh, right now, and I will stop the reflections. And this is a teaser to uh, actually invite you to come back, at least if you don't stay during the whole uh, events and you are warmly uh, invited to stay the whole uh, duration. But uh, I would then at least invite you to come back at the last session where after taking stock of all the two days, I will show you how we believe we have now in front of us the so-called EC2U uh, pan-European knowledge ecosystem. So yes, actually what I wanted to present to you is a, a recent concept which is called the fourth generation university. And actually it is so small on that screen <laughs> that, uh, yes, yeah, so actually, uh, let me, hopefully that, that works like that, yes. Uh, yes, actually on this slide you see uh, that uh, until 2009, um, we were talking usually about the missions of the universities in terms of education and research. 
In 2009, actually, the notion of third generation university was introduced, uh, considering that uh, the universities are doing just more than teaching and doing research, but that they were also somehow active in creating value and knowledge and transfer this knowledge to society. So this is the whole concept of third generation university. In other words, the link between education and research to transfer that knowledge to, uh, to, the, to the society. And for those interested in all what I'm going to present, you have here the uh, references. Uh, as a scientist, I have to cite my sources. There is one, yes. Actually, um, there is a missing, yes, okay. What is the most recent development in this context? Actually, this notion of fourth generation university has been introduced recently, where this time we still have this connection between education, research, and innovation. But instead of only talking about transfer to society, there is this idea that there is also a societal impact on society and regional development can be part of this impact. So basically we introduce now the idea that universities, which is a reality, are connected to the local ecosystem. The consequence of this is that now we can talk about uh, the co-creation of knowledge, which is not anymore only created within the university, but co-created with different types of partners, industry, governmental bodies, but also the, so the civil society. So this is at the very uh, bottom of the concept of this fourth generation university. And of course, this can happen if we have trusted partnerships, because you can't do anything if there is not mutual trust. Uh, and there is, of course, the need to have a local, very active innovation ecosystem. So now we will, and I will show that in the next slide, we will move from a university that was acting global, but not necessarily local, to Okay, um, where indeed now we embed the university into the local innovation ecosystem. So if I look now at this uh, table, you can see actually what is the difference between the third generation university that we are all now familiar, education, research, and knowledge transfer, to this new concept of the fourth generation uh, university. First, the goal. As I said, of course, in the third generation, it was about education, research, and knowledge transfer. In this new approach, we turn to mission-driven, what is also usually uh, described as challenge-based. And this time, it's about education, research, and valorization. So knowledge transfer is switched to valorization. In terms of role, in the third generation, it was to create value. Now it's actually to have the societal or uh, the, the very strong impact on society. The methods. In most universities, we have already seen over the past years this move towards interdisciplinary research. The idea now is to move to transdisciplinary research and multi-actor innovation. In terms of human capital, basically who are the people involved? From the third generation where it was about researchers, professionals, and entrepreneurs, we of course keep those fundamental actors, but we can add, as you see, artists, customers, ecosystem participants. In other words, the rest of the society, the citizens. Orientation. In the third generation, it was more global orientation. Now it's ecosystem oriented. And in terms of interaction, the main uh, partners were from industry. Now it's really a total integration into the global and local uh, ecosystems. So it is those uh, particular points that led us to uh, create the EC2 Alliance and propose uh, the topic of the AI4C2 project. 
the, uh, the transition towards more classical third generation universities to fourth generation universities. So this is the very beginning of this event. So now you know the frame. What we have tried to do during the past three years was to build all the components of this future fourth generation university, which can be also said that we are today unveiling the university of the future. And along the two days, we will present to you all the tools, all the policies that we have jointly uh, created to reach this target of the fourth generation university. And in the very last part, we will take stock of all of this and just see together if we have reached these components so we can officially launch the uh, pan-European knowledge ecosystem. So that is it for the uh, opening session. So now uh, we will actually uh, sort of de-zoom and for that, we have invited some uh, uh, speakers from the uh, European Commission. And it will be my great pleasure now to move to the second part of this uh, uh, first half of the afternoon with the keynote speeches from the uh, representatives from the European Commission. And we gave them as a title, the EU, the European Union, at the forefront of transnational knowledge ecosystems. And hopefully, if everything works well, uh, we will have a first speaker online. So do we have with us Manuel Alesso from uh, the uh, Directorate General for Research? So I just need at least some feedback because in case uh, Manuel Alesso would not be connected with us right now, we could maybe, if uh, our other colleague from the Commission uh, accept, we could maybe switch the order of presentation. Okay. Yes. So in that case, it's my great pleasure to uh, invite on the scene here uh, the second uh, speaker who uh, kindly accepted to join us in Poitiers. So uh, we have with us Jorge Molina Martinez, who is a project advisor at the Research Executive Agency. And you are in particular mostly involved in reforming European research and innovation and research infrastructures. So at the European Commission. So please. Jorge, you are very uh, expected for your speak now. Thank you, Ludovic. Thank you, everybody. I'm bringing my own notes because I fear not to see properly in that screen. You know, it is, it is my sight and the age. So if you don't mind. So yeah, good, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure, you know, Ludovic, it is a pleasure for me to be here in Poitiers, my first time in, in Poitiers, uh, first time at the University of Poitiers. I have to say that I'm impressed by first the city, second the university. I mean, I, I, I didn't know it was that big. Third, the place, it is an amazing place. And actually I didn't even know that it was that old, the University of Poitiers. So a lot of discoveries for me today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jorge Molina. I work at the European Research Executive Agency of the European Commission, is, which is better known as REA. Uh, I work there as a project advisor. Actually, I have been uh, proudly the project officer of RI 4 c 2 So, you know, I have been closely following the development of, of the project, yeah. And, uh, you know, before coming to Poitiers, I was asked uh, to talk, uh, well, to talk, to present uh, some policy reports that we have uh, published, released from the REA uh, recently. Um, but, you know, I, I took the liberty to reorient a little bit the presentation and try to go a little bit farther. I don't know, is it the same presentation time? Yeah. To go a little bit farther and to talk about the importance of feedback to policy, yeah? Feedback to policy, which is actually one of the activities that we carry out at the agency and in which uh, all the projects that we fund and, you know, I foresee two, of course, it is one of them, contribute, and they are very important, you know, for us to contribute to feedback to policy activities. So basically, what I will be talking about is, you know, try to zoom out a little bit, and I will be talking about 
the role of the agency of FAS as commission um, in feedback to policy activities. And I will explain what is it about that of feedback to policy. Why feedback to policy? Why we conduct feedback to policy at, at the REA? Uh, who has been involved in this feedback to policy exercise that has led to the publication of a number of reports that you might be familiar with, but that I will be presenting anyway further on in my presentation. Also, who has been involved in that process? How we have conducted the process? What are the results of that feedback to policy process? And I would say that more importantly, what are we going to do with that? Okay, now we have three nice policy reports where you have been contributed to, but now what is next? So what is the real added value of that policy reports, but also the policy tools that the RI4C2 has developed, for instance. So what are you going to do with that? With this, why is that important for us? So let's start by, by us, by talking, you know, uh, by talking about ourselves. So what is the role of, of REA here? So the European Research Executive Agency of the European Commission is one of the six executive agencies of the, of the commission, yeah? Actually, we're <laughs> the largest one. We are like 900 people working at the agency across four departments. And we have a clear mandate from the commission. And the commission mandates that REA has to implement uh, some parts of Horizon Europe. Yeah? And uh, specifically, the REA is responsible for managing research infrastructures, for managing also uh, Maria Skłodowska Curie actions, for managing the wide era work program, which is the widening plus the era part of the wide era work program. And then also uh, managing some parts of pillar two of Horizon Europe, which is cluster two, cluster three, cluster six, and one of the five missions that we have uh, already in place, which is the EU mission soil for Europe. Yeah, So that amounts for around 22 billion years that we have in our budget, which is a significant part of Horizon Europe, you know, delegated to REA to, to implement. Apart from that, REA also manages other funding programs, uh, although, you know, Horizon Europe is the most important one. But for example, uh, the agency manages the uh, research fund for coal and steel, and also fund um, a program called promotion of agricultural products. On top of that, what we do is that we, also we are also responsible for the research and query service. You as, uh, you know, as beneficiaries know what is that, you know, the portal participant and all, you know, the services around it. And also we are responsible for recruiting and managing evaluators, evaluating the call for proposals, yeah? So uh, in REA, so we have four departments and then we have one department which is called Future Society. I'm trying, you know, to identify within REA who is doing what. So we have one department, which is this department C, Future Society, and there we have one unit, which is the C4, called Reforming European Research and Innovation and Research Infrastructures, yeah? So that unit is responsible for two things, and that's the unit where I belong to. On the one hand, we have the colleagues from the research infrastructures, and then we have the colleagues from the ERA part, and that's one of me. Mm? So all the topics and call for proposals launched through the ERA work program in Horizon Europe are managed by C2, yeah? So that's the mandate that we have. We have a budget of around 400 million euros for the period 2021, 2027, which is the period covering Horizon Europe. And there, you know, we are nine people. I wouldn't say that we are many people. We are only nine people, nine project officers. Of course, we had, you know, some hierarchy above us, but we are nine people working on what? So basically we have three main areas of activity. The first one is project management. The second one is communication. And the third one, and I'm here highlighting in bold, is feedback to policy. So project management is the most important part of our work. So as of today, we, nine people, we manage more than 150 projects. I mean, Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020, because you know that we have this legacy, even though Horizon 2020 is over, but we have the SWOFs legacy from Horizon 20. So that's managed by us. And then also Horizon Europe. So you can see there, you know, the amount of budget beneficiaries and deliverables that we have to manage. Hmm? Again, nine people. Yeah. So we don't get bored. Eh? 
Uh, we cover a broad variety of topics. You know that data, we cover policy coordination, knowledge valorization, we cover open science, citizen science, science communication, research careers, research assessment, of course, European University alliances, or transformation of universities, so ethics, so a very wide range of you know, horizontal topics. And we cover, with all the activity that we manage, we cover more than half of the era actions of the era policy agenda. So you know that the, the current era policy agenda 2022-2024 has 20 actions. So we cover 11 actions so far, yeah? So that's the core uh, activity of our uh, sector. But apart from that, we do communication and we do feedback to policy. So communication, what is it? Okay, so what we do is that we support our projects in communication activities, for example, I don't know, Ludovic tells me, hey, listen, we have this activity. Can we have the support from Rhea, you know, to, um, to amplify communication on dissemination of our activities or whatever? We provide that service. And also from time to time, we publish what we call, I don't know, maybe you are familiar with it, what we call Cordis Results Pack. So, you know, the Cordis is the big European database of research. So, from time to time, what we do is that we feature significant, I mean, outstanding projects, th thematically speaking, and then we deliver like publications of, on, on certain thematics. For example, uh, the latest one is one results pack that we have published on ethics and integrity in research and innovation. But we address other topics, for example, science communication, science education, so on and so forth, yeah? And then we have feedback to policy, and feedback to policy, uh, even though it is not the core uh, business of our sector, but we do that because actually we are supposed not to dedicate more than 3% of our time to this task. I can tell you that we dedicate much more than 3% to the feedback to policy uh, that I find very, very much uh, interesting. So, you know, what is feedback to policy? So, you know that the commissioner services Commission itself, they are responsible for the policy making aspects of the European research area and the European uh, research policy agenda. So they do the policies and they draft the work programs and we, uh, REA, the agency, implements the work programs, right? So to ensure that the commission's policy making process is enriched or fed with uh, evidence from the projects funded, we need a mechanism th that we call feedback to policy plan. So what we want is that, okay, we fund a lot of projects. Those projects produce quite a lot of very interesting results, and we really want those results to have an impact. That goes, you know, in the direction that Ludovico mentioned in, in the previous presentation, to have a clear impact on society, for instance, but also we want that the results from the projects that we fund have an impact on the policy making process so that the commission colleagues, they can keep on defining new policies, improving new policies, defining new work programs, new funding, uh, you know, areas and so on and so forth, yeah? So we, we have this feedback to policy plan. So the reports that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit further on my presentation are framed in the feedback to policy plan 2023. So we have a feedback to policy plan every year, and you know, those reports that I will tell you about are framed in the previous year's feedback to policy plan. So that feedback to policy plan 2023 covers the era part of, of Horizon Europe, but also cover, com covers completed and ongoing SWOFs projects from Horizon 2020. So what, you, what we have done to define that feedback to policy plan is to take you know, information from 250 projects there, you know, and trying to extract those policy instruments that have a real added value and to fit them into the commission services, yeah? So, um, you can see there from, the, uh, from that graphic, um, 20 actions, which are, you know, which, which uh, comprises the ERA policy agenda 2022-2024, and how the money has been invested by the commission in the different ERA actions. 
We have to bear in mind that the ERA part of the Way That I Work program, you know, uh, and the projects that we fund are directly linked to help the implementation of different ERA, ERA policy actions of the ERA policy agenda. You know, you know, I told you that we cover around 11 actions, but we have, for example, that most of the money so far has gone to action 14, which is citizen science. Yeah. Then we have also uh, quite a lot of resources going to action four, which is research careers, uh, including research skills. Also, uh, action five is gender. That means that a lot of resources have, have, uh, have gone to gender. Action nine, which is um, international cooperation, if I'm not wrong. Action 13, which is European University Alliances. You know that the, the RI4C2, of course, it, it was... Um, an IBA action, which is an identified beneficiary action. I mean, money going directly to the European University Alliances. So there you can see, you know, where the money has gone since 2021 and up to date, no? But there are a number of policy priorities that will define in a way where the resources and the money will go in the future. Yeah, and this is something that uh, it has been identified and decided by the Commission, of course, by RTD, but also in coordination with the REA. Yeah, and then in 2023, um, a number of priorities were defined, and priorities were defined on research careers, including research skills and research management, uh, and research assessment, and then transformation of universities. So those were the priorities. I mean, that doesn't exclude other era actions, of course not. But, you know, there was an interest, a political interest, you know, on dedicating more efforts, attention, and maybe, who knows, resources to those actions, yeah? Research careers, uh, research management, research assessment, and transformation of universities, yeah? I think that I'm showing a different slide. Uh, sorry, yeah, there. Sorry about that. You see there that I'm, yeah, the policy priorities, 2023. Mm? Um, okay, and once those priorities have been defined, what to do regarding to policy, uh, to feedback to policy? So we proposed first to focus on three specific actions, which are Air Action 3, Air Action 4, and Air Action 13, and elaborate some policy reports. Mm -hmm. So we propose to uh, elaborate a report on research assessment, another report, policy report on research skills, and another one on good practices from European University Alliances Pilot 2. Apart from that, that we call big tickets, so that are a products that we are going to uh, produce in the frame of that feedback to policy plan, of course, we have continuous feedback to policy activities in parallel. Yeah, For example, we, as agency, are involved in the drafting of the work programs uh, elaborated by, by the Commission. So the Commission, from time to time, they also consult us on the work program and we provide with, with feedback, yeah? Feedback that normally comes, or one of the sources of our feedback from the agency to the Commission comes from the evaluators of the call for proposals. So when we conduct, for example, the evaluation of proposals, we ask the evaluators to give us feedback. Feedback on the process, feedback on the topic, feedback on the, you know, on the policy implications of the topic, and then we take that feedback and then we pass it on to the Commission as well, yeah? So that it helps uh, the draft the new work programs. Of course, we report to the program committee and advisory groups. Of course, we have the policy briefs. You know that all the U European University alliances, they deliver two policy briefs during the whole uh, life of the project. So we take those policy briefs, we analyze those policy briefs, and we feed the commission with that policy recommendations coming from you. And of course, we try to participate as much as we can in um, key policy groups or committees, for example, the program committees, the ERA forum, we try to, to follow the ERA forum, and the for you one and the for you two. Yeah, so that's that's done on a continuous basis, I would say. Yeah. So, who has been the people involved in those reports? 
quite a lot of people actually. So the reports have not been uh, done by the commission or by us. Eh? We rely on experts, external experts, of course. So it is a joint exercise made by external experts, by the agency, by REA, and by the colleagues from the commission from RTD. So, you know, you have there the names, of course it is public and they are in, in all the reports. You might be familiar with some of the names because actually some of these experts are also reviewers of, of projects, you know? And, uh, and yeah, uh, indeed, you know, one of the experts have been the reviewers of the RI-42. So they might be familiar to you. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, uh, besides experts, REA and the commission, we have counted on your support, project coordinators, and I will tell you now why, because we reached you in the middle of the process just to get some feedback from you to the reports that we were producing. And of course, at the end of the process, we count with the support of the EU Publication Office and the REA Communications Department, you know, to, to, uh, to communicate and disseminate um, the, the information. So how the process has been uh, conducted? It took us like six months to prepare all the reports, the three reports. 15 people were involved in this exercise. It has been fully funded by, by the agency. We involved more than 60 projects here, which means that six, more than 16 projects have been analyzed and screened by the experts. There you can see 39 on research assessment, 16 on research skills, and the 22 European University Alliances from Pilot 2. So what, what the experts have done is that for each of those 60 something projects, they have analyzed policy briefs, they have analyzed periodic reports, they have analyzed deliverables and reviewer assessments. So it's a huge amount of work. Uh, you know, behind behind the reports. We have had an intense coordination between the experts, REA and RTD. You know, from REA, we don't conduct the work, of course, uh, that relies on the experts, but we monitor and we make sure that it, 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 it's also in line with the requirements from the commission, from RTD. And of course, after that, it is validated and endorsed by the high level uh, management uh, of, of the agency. And after that, we, uh, we rely on, um, on the services from the area for the communication and dissemination purposes. So these are the three reports. Yeah? The reports were published in March. These reports uh, on research skills, report on research assessments, and good practices from European University Alliance's Pilot 2, uh, you may have received them already because actually, um, the first thing that we did when they were published was to target all the European University alliances. It was also uh, presented to the ERA Forum uh, and therefore, you know, presented to the member states. Yeah. And they fit into the new ERA policy platform. You know that uh, a new ERA policy platform has been created. Uh, you, you may have, you, 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 you may have known it already. And there is an interesting uh, repository where all the policy instruments, you know, and all, yeah, I mean, all, all policy instruments related to the area policy agenda has been stored and displayed there. So any information related to the area policy agenda, it is compiled in a nice way, which is being improved in the area policy platform. But let me, uh, because I don't want to go through the three reports, but uh, you know, I would like to focus a little bit on the report on good practices from the European University Alliances Pilot 2. You know that this report um, complements another report that we published in March 2023, which was the progress of University Alliances Projects Pilot 1. But differently to this one, the one that we have published in, in March 2024, it is not a progress report, but a compendium of good practices. Compendium of good practices from the uh, 2022 projects funded under the pilot two of the European University Alliances. Yeah? So basically what it does is that showcases those good practices selected by the experts. I can tell you that it was extremely difficult to pick good practices. 
extremely difficult. I mean, we have 22 European University Alliances Pilot 2, and we have dozens of very good practices. But uh, we didn't want really to make a compendium of good practices very huge or something like that. So basically the experts, you know, came to the conclusion that, okay, what is it a good practice? So they decided that a good practice should be something administratively and technically feasible, effective and successful, and more importantly, replicable and adaptable. Something that could be used as a best case example for others to be maybe replicated or emuled, yeah? So it is not an exhaustive compendium, and I can tell you that, you know, after that, we got some, uh, we were reached by some alliances saying that, hey, but the example that you pick for my alliance is not the best one. I have many other examples to show you, yeah? Sorry about that, you know? Maybe more uh, reports will come in the future, yeah? Still, we try to involve in a way, in the best possible way that we could to the coordinators and consortium of the European University Alliances by validating the information selected by the experts. But still, I mean, this is not a closed document and I'm pretty sure that more reports and better reports will come in the future. But still, you know, it provides, I think that a good overview of examples uh, of good practices Maybe not the best ones, but good practices. And also it provides uh, conclusions and recommendations to the European University Alliances mostly, but also recommendations that we take and we, uh, yeah, that we take and, and we pass on to our colleagues in the Commission. Yeah. Of course, uh, RI4C2 is recognized as a good practice there, in particular in, in, in open science. I don't know if it is the best example from the Alliance. But it is one of them, you know, I'm pretty sure that you have, I'm pretty sure, I know, I'm sure that you have many other good examples in the, in the Alliance, but this is the one picked in the report. Yeah. Um, I don't know what is the time, Ludovic, uh, I'm fine, yeah. Um, and, and probably the most important thing, because this was a very interesting exercise and very enriching, and we learned a lot from the projects, you know, when you are, all day long in the bubble of project management, eh? and you step aside and you dig into feedback to policy and you can really see what the projects are doing, it's really enriching, yeah? So what are we going to do now with these policy reports and with the, poli um, with the results that you have produced? Well, the first thing is that these policy reports have already contributed directly to the era policy agenda, to the current era policy agenda. Mm? So the thing is that we have very interesting cases, examples, uh, recommendation, conclusions and recommendations that fit directly into ERA actions 3, 4 and 13. That's the, the first result. I have to tell you that the European University Alliances, they are so wide uh, in many ways that of course they contribute to many other actions of the ERA policy agenda there. You can see you contribute to one, five, I mean, you have seven transformation modules, and as such, you contribute to many other ERA actions apart from the 13, yeah? So that's one thing. But the current ERA policy agenda is coming to an end, well, coming to an end, the current one. You know that we are still working on the continuation of the ERA policy agenda, 2025, 2027. Work is still in progress. <clears throat> ERA Forum is doing a great job, member states, together with the Commission and the stakeholders, in proposing new actions for the new ERA policy agenda. There is one specific action, uh, which is unleashing the full RNI potential of Europe's universities, with, in a way, it's kind of continuation of the current ERA Action 13. So, still more support to, yeah more support to the RNI dimension of the European universities will be considered and take it into account in the next ERA policy agenda. And, uh, but other potential uh, ERA actions for you as European universities to be considered are also um, proposed in the next ERA policy agenda. For example, open science, research infrastructures, research careers, research assessment or knowledge valorization. So still, you know, you, have contributed a lot to the ERA policy agenda, you still can contribute a lot to the next ERA policy agenda. So it is clear that these reports and the policy results that you have produced contribute to the ERA policy agenda. But 
it also contributes to the next framework program, to the FP10. You know that we are halfway Horizon Europe. Uh, we are close to the interim impact report of Horizon Europe, yeah? But we are already working on the next framework program. We are already working, the commission is already working on how the era will look like in FP10. Uh, RTD is proposing different scenarios for the era in the next framework program, which means volume of funding, uh, coverage, which actions will be covered, will be the new era more aligned to the era policy agenda, and therefore the work programs will fund dedicated their actions. Who knows? Still too soon to say, but the commission and, and, and us, we are already working on that. And I can tell you something, that the policy reports and the work that you have contributed with has been fed into the uh, into the position papers of the of the FP10. So it is really taking into account, yeah? So, yeah, this this is it, more or less, what I wanted to talk to you about, about the um, the policy, uh, the, the feedback to policy. Um, I'm very happy to see that you are launching a PECE. By the way, it's a very nice acronym, PECE, yeah? Because it's also very much in line with other instruments that we already have in place to support knowledge ecosystems. You know that we have now uh, an open call for proposals supporting talent ecosystems, for instance, which is, I understand that, much in line with the knowledge ecosystem that we are proposing. So it's good to see that you are going in the right direction. Well, I, I don't know if the right direction, but at least a similar direction to the one that we are going, I mean, from, from the commission side, which is, which is a very good thing, yeah? And just to finish, um, just uh, a reminder, uh, you know that in September this year, we will have the next ERA conference, 20, uh, ERA conference 2024, that will take place on the 18th and 19th of September, if I'm not wrong, or maybe the 17th or 18th, I'm sorry, but, you know, no, no, 18th and, 18th and 19th of September in Brussels. Um, you may already have received some information about the conference. The conference will be a two-day conference and will be presenting first uh, what has been achieved already in the frame of the current era policy uh, agenda, 2022-2024. And the second day will be more focused on the future of, of the era, all right? And also we have a joint final conference. I don't know if call it like that, but I, I couldn't find any other way to call it. Joint final conference of European University Alliances, SWAFs projects uh, on the 4th of October in Brussels, kindly, you know, uh, pushed and steered by Ludovic and by RI4C2. So I'm looking forward, you know, to learning more about the activity and please count with our support for anything you need. Um, and yeah, and that's everything from my side. I hope that I gave you a little bit more uh, information of what we do in REA, apart from, you know, clicking buttons and and managing projects and really how important feedback to policy is because even though we don't do policy in rea but we uh, contribute to the policy making cycle by trying you know to valorize the results that we produced with the with the projects that we fund and that's everything thank you very much thank you very much uh, Jorge, for this uh, uh, these details that also show uh, to us uh, what is practically done at the European Commission uh, and the different uh, uh, bodies that are involved in uh, preparing uh, the policies that then we see arriving at the level of the different countries and in the different sectors. So it's good to, to also see how this is uh, performed and that uh, uh, we are part of that uh, process somehow. Uh, I have been informed that in principle we have our second speaker from the European Commission online. So Manuel, are you with us? Yes, indeed, Ludovic. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Wonderful. Wonderful to see you. Uh, let me quickly introduce you to our uh, colleagues here in the room and online. So uh, Manuel Alessio, you are the head of the unit entitled ERA 
European research area, spreading excellence and research careers. So you are working with the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the Commission, and uh, you will uh, basically complement uh, the uh, presentation from uh, Jorge on providing also uh, uh, how actually, and this is related to the topic of the uh, of this session, how actually in Europe we are uh, really pushing in this direction uh, towards a transnational knowledge ecosystem, which is something that we also try to achieve at the level of our EC2 Alliance and its AI4C2 project. So please, Manuel, uh, it's your turn now. Uh, Ludovic, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, first of all, I uh, apologize that I cannot be with you uh, physically uh, in Poitiers. Uh, I am in uh, Poland right now, from Poland to Poitiers. Um, and, uh, and I will tell you in a moment a little bit about what I'm doing here because it's relevant, I think, to the discussions today. Um, if you allow me, I will share a presentation and thank you very much to Jorge because his, I think his presentation was very uh, interesting and um, uh, I hope that uh, mine will uh, uh, somehow complement his. Um, I'm in the process of trying to share my screen. I hope you can see it. I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, we can see it, but it is still very small for the people in the room. So let we, we will probably just, yes, exactly. Now we have uh, moved the different windows. I hope I'm trying to. I will I'm give also you. I'm having a rather slow connection, I'm afraid. So it, it could take a, a few seconds. Don't worry, we have, we have time. Indeed, we, in principle, the setup is fine, but we still have a black window. It, yes. it should be okay now, yes, let's see. we see. But indeed, that there is a long way between Poland and Poitiers. That's why. <laughs> indeed. So, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, share with you a few thoughts about what we've been doing in terms of the European research area, where we are going. Uh, Jorge has already mentioned some uh, important points, and I'll go over them again a little bit, maybe in a bit more detail. Um, and uh, in the meantime, as I say, I'd like to share with you a little bit what I'm doing here in Poland, because I think it's very uh, interesting uh, for you and for your work. Uh, and it's uh, absolutely part of the era and the implementation of the era policy agenda. So just a quick recap from the beginning. Uh, we have been putting in place gradually several um, instruments, several policy instruments, several processes. Uh, as you remember, this started with the ERA communication in 2020, where we set out the first policy framework, then the adoption of the pact with principles, with priority areas for joint action, with also a policy co coordination mechanism. This is very important, uh, a monitoring mechanism. And then, of course, a new era governance, the era forum, where, of course, Ludovic uh, is uh, very active in different capacities. Uh, and, uh, and many of you, of course, are, are very active and, and we welcome that immensely. Um, and this allows us to have what didn't exist, I think, before in this way, which was a collaboration between member states, associated countries, stakeholders, uh, together around the table. And this for us is very, very important because we don't see how we can implement the European research area in, uh, uh, in any other way. Uh, this is not an area in which we can simply legislate uh, and uh, make things happen through a top-down legislative mechanism. This doesn't, uh, simply doesn't work like that. Um, so, as you know, in, in, in 2021, the ERA policy agenda, this first ERA policy agenda was adopted. Um, the, the, um, this ERA policy agenda was in a way, uh, uh, and is still in a way, somewhat experimental, because as you will notice there, uh, some actions are, uh, well, we can say we cheated a little bit. 
For example, Action 19 uh, is the error monitoring mechanism, which we would have to implement anyway. And of course, this is now um, running, it's now uh, on track, um, but it's not what I would consider a proper error action. So you will not see this in the next error policy agenda. But we were also trying to learn ourselves, learning by doing. And so some of the uh, actions you see today, uh, of course, some worked better than others. Um, I give you one example of one that I think worked quite well uh, and that uh, you have also been uh, quite closely involved and that's action four on research careers. Together, we have managed to, um, I think, implement most of the deliverables of action four. Um, very quickly, I can mention them. It's the uh, Council Recommendation on Research Careers, which we worked on together and was adopted by the Council, Research Comp, um, the uh, MLE that we are now kicking off, uh, the Observatory on Research Careers that we are now starting also with the, uh, um, with the uh, OECD. So all of these uh, uh, instruments we are uh, somehow putting together gradually. And today, here in uh, Poland, in Katowice, uh, we, are, we are having uh, uh, yesterday, today and tomorrow, the Euraxis Biennial Conference that we have every two years. And we have uh, formally um, unveiled and, 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 and uh, started the new ERA Talent Platform, as well as the revamped Euraxis uh, website um, with, with new functionalities, of course. And this is uh, extremely important because, uh, again, in the context of Action 4, I think one of the most significant um, actions in practice that actually uh, contribute to improving research careers uh, is precisely the Euraxis network. Uh, because the Euraxis network brings together people who are on the ground actually solving problems and trying to remove obstacles to uh, mobility of researchers in Europe and to receiving researchers from outside Europe and uh, facilitating their integration uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, all points of view, including the bureaucratic uh, uh, issues that uh, people are confronted with when they move to the uh, European Union. So I, I cannot emphasize enough how important this network is, how important it is for us to, in the context of developing research careers in Europe, to nurture, to encourage, to support this network and to facilitate uh, its work. And this is uh, precisely what we are doing here in uh, Katowice these days. Um, so as I mentioned, the Arab policy platform uh, uh, is also online. Actually, I didn't mention this. I talked about the talent platform, but Jorge did uh, 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 mention this. This is quite important. Uh, the era policy platform is where you can um, find the um, monitoring mechanism of the European research area. So what will you find in the policy platform? Well, you find the reports, the 18-month uh, report on the implementation of the European research area, the national reports, member state by member state. Uh, you will also find a map in which you can click on different countries and you can see the different actions in which countries participate and what, are, what is the status of these uh, uh, respective actions. Um, and, uh, uh, and you have uh, a lot more information, of course, related to the implementation of the uh, European uh, research area. We have a challenge here. This only works, I mean, we can produce all the reports we want, but this can only work really in an optimal way if we can convince the member states to upload their own measures, their own initiatives in the air policy platform. And this is not happening yet, probably because this is very recent. But we have to, as much as possible, um, uh, make uh, uh, everyone understand that implementing the European research area is not just about uh, EU measures. I would say it's really not that much about EU measures. It's about what happens on the ground in member states. Um, and, uh, um, and so this participation of member states in uh, sharing with the community what is going on in their own, uh, uh, at their own national level, I think is crucial. 
And so this is an area where we still have to work on and we still have to improve uh, our, um, uh, our work. But again, uh, I'm, uh, the, 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 I think the fact that we already have reports with sufficient quality uh, w which show the uh, and, and, and can can uh, portray in a, in a reasonable way the implementation of the different actions, uh, I think is already quite a positive uh, development and allows us to, uh, together with the different uh, uh, different uh, other instruments such as the feedback to policy as Jorge explained, allow us to refine our understanding of what we need, for the next era policy agenda, what we need in terms of actions to develop the European research area. So this is all work in progress, so to speak, uh, and uh, and uh, and it's work that we do together. We do it together with you, uh, with the stakeholder representatives uh, uh, in the era forum, with the member states. What's happening now in the immediate future? Um, well, we have one one thing that already happened, so that's in the recent past, not, no longer in the immediate future. Uh, that's the letter report. I think the letter report is is quite important because it, um, in a way, uh, it, it, it is a re report about the single market. It's it's called much more than a market. It talks about the four freedoms, and then it says, well, the four freedoms are not enough. We need a fifth freedom. So we recover in the letter report the expression fifth freedom, which was a sort of an expression already of the past. And I think it's great that uh, uh, Enrico Letta recovered this expression uh, because pulling, and this is not consensual among also colleagues in the commission, that we should call the European research area the fifth freedom, um, because uh, some people think that this is uh, excessively uh, assimilated to the single market. I don't really mind that, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think it's reasonable today to, uh, especially in a report which is about the single market, to point out that the single market cannot just be implemented with the four freedoms traditionally in the, in the treaty, and that indeed the European research area, uh, although it's not called fifth freedom in the treaty, it is in Article 179, and it corresponds to an evolution of the treaty in the sense that it was introduced with the Lisbon Treaty. So before, the European research area existed as a policy, but was not integrated into the treaty. This happened uh, um, in fairly recent years, which, of course, shows that the constitutional legislator of the European Union um, considered that an evolution had to take place. And so, for, for these reasons, I think it's absolutely fair that the letter report mentions the fifth freedom and uh, uh, makes an appeal. And again, if we look at what is written there, one of the important points that, that, is, uh, that is mentioned is precisely the careers of researchers, the skills of researchers, the mobility of researchers. All of these uh, uh, extremely important and complex issues that we try to address together and that we know uh, do not have a magical uh, solution, but do require a, a lot of attention and efforts from our part. Um, we uh, will have very, very shortly an ERAC opinion, hopefully, on the next ERA policy agenda adopted uh, on the 26th of June. Uh, this is being drafted by uh, a, a group of three member states, so the Commission is not involved in drafting this uh, ERAC opinion, which is, which is correct. It's, it's how it should be. Um, and um, hopefully this opinion will give us some indication, uh, some more formal indication about the expectation of the member states uh, regarding the next ERAC policy agenda. I don't want to spoil the, the surprise, uh, but I don't anticipate a big deviation in relation to what has been discussed and proposed in the ERA forum so far. I think uh, ERAC's message will be something along the lines of, you know, work on this set of actions that you have on the table in the ERA forum, work to refine them. Don't worry too much about what you should remove, what you should keep, but really improve these, these proposals, and then we will see what we keep 
uh, in the in the policy agenda once it is proposed by the Commission and then adopted by the Council. And this should happen um, next year in the course of the first semester of 2025 under the um, Polish presidency. But in the meantime, uh, we will have an ERA conference. Uh, uh, Jorge uh, mentioned this. Uh, this conference will uh, uh, open, broaden the scope of uh, participants beyond the small group that participates in the ERA forum. Uh, we will have, of course, um, uh, some attention to uh, actual ERA actions, but uh, uh, we will be looking very much into broader policy issues for the future. And I think this will make it very interesting. Otherwise, it would simply be an enlarged era for a meeting. And I don't think this is what you would be interested or what would you attract you to come to the to the era conference. Uh, so um, th there will be, unfortunately, a limitation of places, but still, I think we will have around uh, 300 places. So there will still be uh, um, space for for uh, uh, many more guests than than we usually have in the uh, era forum meetings. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will also have um, the opportunity to have discussions, uh, not only in a plenary setting, but also in breakout sessions. And probably with a, a ministerial component, we'll try to have some ministers there from the future presidencies that uh, will be involved in adopting the future era policy agenda. Uh, in order to interact with the participants, because I think this is part of the interest of, uh, of such an event. Um, also, not to be forgotten that the uh, council conclusions will uh, be adopted under the Hungarian presidency. They are still uh, obviously reflecting upon exactly what should be the content of these uh, council conclusions. But again, I don't think I would be betraying a major secret if I um, said that there will be certainly an emphasis on the European research area because these will be adopted in uh, late November, so very close to the end of the year. But uh, I think we will see uh, a strong connection to uh, the theme of competitiveness, which again makes sense in light of the letter report and in light of the Draghi report that will be adopted in the, in the near future. So I think... For us also, for you, for uh, uh, us in the Commission, I think it's important that we keep in mind that we also need to often contextualize uh, the European research area in this perspective of the fifth freedom, the single market, as an, a crucial element for competitiveness uh, of uh, uh, the European Union. It's internal competitiveness, of course, the, but also it's external competitiveness, uh, and uh, that uh, goes without saying. Um, one last, I, I, I'm conscious of the time going by, Ludovic, so, so I will not uh, uh, prolong uh, 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 much more my uh, intervention, but I just wanted to uh, uh, spend a minute or two um, uh, to uh, allow colleagues to have a look at the uh, proposals that are now on the table, the 23 uh, proposals that are on the table for the next era policy agenda, uh, 2025 to 2027. Um, you will see they are divided among the four uh, uh, areas in the pact. Um, and one of the interesting things of just looking at the um, uh, at these proposals is that you see that there's quite uh, a high number of proposals in the left side on the uh, 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 under deepening an internal market for knowledge, which is the, more or less the usual, the classical uh, themes that you would expect to see, careers, open science, uh, research assessment, research infrastructures. But then you will see uh, on, the, on the right side, under the thematic areas, green and digital transition, uh, you will see quite a number of proposals there too. And I think this is a good sign uh, because it shows that we are not just focusing on horizontal issues that we are all sort of used to discussing and comfortable in discussing, but also moving into um, uh, using the, res the European research area in a thematic logic, mobilizing uh, member states, EU and national resources to achieve common objectives, which is also what is uh, uh, somehow in the pact. Um, one area where I think I, I'm a little bit disappointed 
but not very surprised, is that uh, on investments and reforms, as you see there, there is not a lot. Uh, there's just a, a, a proposal on a foresight, a foresight community of practice, which even in, 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 even in that area is not, I think, particularly ambitious. But, um, but there's uh, nothing really um, in relation to uh, uh, investments, which you recall in the current era policy agenda, there was this Action 20 that nobody wanted to, uh, uh, to, uh, to implement or there was not a critical mass of member states who wanted to implement it. Um, and this also shows that you know, there's still quite a lot of difficulty uh, from the side of member states to uh, discuss the issue of uh, investments in RNI, which I think is a little bit of a shame. And I think the discussion should focus much more on uh, private investment rather than public investment, which is sort of the embarrassing part for member states to discuss because it's, it, it involves budgetary national decisions and options. Uh, but I think where, where we need to work when we look at the figures of uh, investment uh, in Europe, private versus public investment, uh, and when we compare it to the rest of the world, it's in the private investment that we need really to uh, improve. And um, one last word, this is simply about the structure, this is a bit more bureaucratic, but you will not be surprised if you see in the next proposal for the ERA policy agenda, a distinction between structural policies and ERA actions. So my hope is that we will come to a relatively smaller number of ERA actions, but that some important policies will still be there, um, not necessarily as ERA actions that need to impl be implemented in three years, but, uh, but will, which will be present as important structural policies that need to continue uh, to be developed. So this is uh, uh, one of the um, options that the uh, uh, ERA forum explored uh, in order to make sure that we capture the important things, that we don't leave important policies aside, but that we have a relatively condensed number of actions where uh, uh, member states, stakeholders, and the different actors can focus their efforts. So I stop here. Uh, I thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm uh, happy to uh, uh, answer any comments and questions. Thank you very much, Manuela. This was very interesting to see also the sort of uh, the other side of the coin. Huh? We have seen before how uh, there is this, um, these mechanisms to feed the policy discussion, and you showed actually how then these policies are collegially discussed and, and then actions are proposed. So it was uh, actually interesting also to show all the, uh, the participants uh, I would dare to say also the complexity uh, of all the process, uh, but it's important that we are all aware uh, of this uh, process because uh, that's that's part of the reality. And uh, somehow I hope that uh, uh, some of our colleagues also see that uh, projects like the AI4C2 or what we also deliver within the ECG Alliance are actually an integral part of this, uh, this process. They are not the only one clearly, but we do actually participate also to this uh, uh, collegial construction of the future policies, in particular in the r and field. Uh, if you agree to, to stay with us, uh, let's say uh, five to 10 minutes, uh, Manuel, we have uh, also Jorge still on, on, the, on the, the scene with us. So uh, we can maybe open now for some uh, uh, questions if there are from the, the room. So we have the microphones here. Probably you, you will need to, to take one, uh, Jorge, at some point. So do we have uh, here questions? We also have uh, people online. So uh, let's see if we, if we have some, uh, some questions here. Do not hesitate. We don't have so, uh, so many often possibility to directly interact with uh, the colleagues from the commission. So that's, uh, that's really the opportunity. Well, please. So if uh, each of you can uh, first introduce yourself and then uh, ask your question. Yeah. I'm Jorge Hernández from the University of Salamanca. And I would like to, to ask to Jorge and Manuel, uh, how are you um, moving, doing that transformation process in alliances? Because that's a debate we have in universities. How are we uh, switching from being um, 
uh, Mobility Erasmus uh, program, let's to say, Erasmus Plus Mobility program, based basically on mobilities, how are we moving to a more um, getting in the air and I dimension? That's the point. Uh, what, what is the consideration between? That's when, when we are speaking with our managers in our universities, they are asking us what is going to happen with the alliances structure. So this would be more focusing air and I. That's something that is clear after your speeches today. But what are the thoughts about that? Okay, thank you very much. Ma Ma Manuel, do you, want, do you want to go first? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, Jorge. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to. Um, uh, th thank you very much for the question. Um, well, before uh, uh, saying something about alliances, um, um, I, I thought your comment about uh, transformation versus mobility was quite interesting. Uh, I hadn't seen, I confess, I hadn't seen things in that light. For me, I, I, I would like to think that we are working on both uh, sides, that we are working on transformation and uh, on uh, mobility. Because I think, um, I don't see how we can credibly um, develop a European research area without uh, addressing the barriers and the obstacles to uh, mobility within the uh, European space. Uh, so for, for me, that is a, a fundamental uh, uh, point, uh, and it's one that we have not resolved, uh, uh, not even close. Um, otherwise, uh, your access would probably not be necessary. Um, uh, so so, so uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think both things are, are, are extremely important. Uh, we do have to work on the transformation, but we also need to work on uh, mobility. But on alliances specifically, um, I think I'm a great fan of alliances, I have to say. I think they're a fantastic uh, instrument. Uh, and what I like about them is that they're all very different and that they all have different objectives and different um, uh, uh, and, 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 and they pursue uh, different visions. Um, some uh, want uh, to establish a regular form of cooperation. Others uh, want to move together to constitute a single uh, European uh, uh, university, a single European uh, entity. Um, and, uh, and, and I know that the, the, this, this diversity is very positive. Um, what I think is that... Uh, uh, as to the future uh, modalities of funding for alliances. I know that DG EAC is reflecting upon this uh, and they are also discussing with us from the research and innovation side, what should be, what could be uh, funding instruments for the future. But in the meantime, we, we are living in the present. And I think in the present, there are uh, alliances are a privileged uh, a partner, a privileged actor um, in applying for certain calls uh, for uh, funding in certain uh, areas. And this we see already today. Uh, and uh, if you allow me to uh, uh, do a little bit of publicity, uh, we, uh, we opened recently a call, uh, this pilot call for research careers um, for early stage researchers, which is a relatively big pilot because in the meantime we got a bit more money together. Uh, and, uh, and so it... it for me, alliances are obviously privileged um, uh, candidates to, to, to apply to this call because uh, what we want to establish is consortia that uh, provide employment to uh, uh, researchers. And uh, so we want to improve the employability of researchers through this kind of initiative. Um, so for me, uh, somehow the question is not so much... Um, how do we support alliances in the future, but uh, are alliances um, somehow um, privileged partners and, and particularly strong partners to uh, engage, to apply, to uh, integrate consortia, etc.? And I think we, we start seeing that that is the case, and in some calls, alliances are very successful already. Um, so um, uh, I, I would say that we, we, we have to certainly, and, and I've discussed this with Ludovic uh, uh, more than once, we have certainly to look in, into the future um, what kind of modalities would make sense and what kind of modalities should we uh, pursue. But in the meantime, in the present, I think alliances are very, very uh, 
solid partners, let's say. Jorge? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. I, I agree very much with Manuel. I mean, in my opinion, I can under, I, I can I cannot understand either uh, you know, a European research area without the mobility component. But just to give you a different uh, perspective from a more uh, implementation angle, yeah? Well, I, I think that the first thing is that, to me, University Alliances is a great initiative by the European Commission. A big effort from the Commission has been uh, invested to support European universities. We cannot forget that more than 1 billion euros uh, have been invested to support European University Alliances, 1 billion euros. I mean, if we take into account Erasmus Plus, Horizon 2020, and the IT, uh, so, which is a significant amount of resources, from an implementation point of view, of course, University Alliances were creating the frame of the Erasmus Plus, where the r &I dimension was not, I wouldn't say not covered, but it wasn't the priority. And then, you know, and then uh, RTD stood up and proposed an 80 million pilot to reinforce the r &I dimension of European University Alliances, you know. I think that was a good step forward by the Commission, you know, just to strengthen the r &I dimension of the European universities, which, in my opinion, has proved to be a success because European University Alliances has indeed been able to develop a common r &I agenda and to strengthen, you know, uh, the, their institutions from seven different angles, you know, covering the seven transformation modules, yeah? The good thing here is that, as Manuel mentioned, I think that the coordination between EAC and RTD, you know, can be perceived by the single fat, fact that the second Erasmus Plus call for proposals already include a work package on r &I. So you know that, you know, you can see that, that the r &I dimension is being, in a way, being integrated in the European University Alliance scheme, also at EAC level, you know, that it is dedicating funding to address that through a dedicated work package. Still, it, it, it's, it's too short. I mean, European University Alliances were launched in 2018, right? 18. So it's been only, you know, five, six years. But, you know, let's consider the, the amount of resources and effort that has been put on them. To me, it's already a success. Still, you know, this, we have this goal of reaching 60 European universities by uh, 2024, let's see. So things are moving on. Still, we have the European degree, uh, which is being pushed forward. Uh, still, um, okay, uh, a significant amount of resources was dedicated specifically to um, 39 European University Alliances through identified beneficiary actions through Horizon 2020. Now, as Manuel mentioned, we have a very interesting 20 million pilot, you know, to create talent ecosystems and, and you know, and to, yeah, and, and to, again, yeah, um, which is not maybe directly targeted to European University Alliances, but you as European University Alliances are a very privileged, you know, uh, beneficiary to go for it because you already have a solid, um, a solid ground already that you built. So, you know, who knows about the future? You know, I know about the present. Still, I can see that the Commission is making an effort to keep supporting European University Alliances. Maybe not as much evident as it was in the past, which to me, it makes sense because, you know, in the past there was a clear, um, yeah, uh, there was a clear intention to support an initiative which was very much promising when it was first created, the European University Alliances. But I see, I think that the European University Alliances, um, you know, is, is stand up very strong as a strong uh, partner to to apply for yeah yeah for, for future for present and future funding. That's that's how I see it. Thank you very much. Actually, we have somehow here uh, the best uh, transition towards the rest of the program because indeed in the next uh, two days we will uh, show uh, to everybody what we have created as an alliance and its RNI dimension 
project, uh, all these tools that will continue to exist in the new consolidation phase of the C2 Alliance. So this is exactly what you uh, just described, uh, that we are uh, now really entering into a much more solid phase where we integrate all these components together and we will see indeed how the future is. But uh, uh, so far, uh, we are really uh, all strongly committed. And I would like uh, to take this opportunity to thank both of you, Emmanuel and Jorge, for having accepted to Sorry, to sorry Ludovic, yeah, if, you, if you allow me, I, I forgot to mention something as well which is we cannot forget the widening funding coming from widening. So we have the, the excellence initiative that many European universities has taken advantage of. So you know that still is more resources going to, not only to the R and I dimension, because I mean, we understand that the European excellence initiative, it has a strong component on widening countries, but still, you know, more resources going there. So, so yeah, yeah, just to complement that, because I, f I forgot to mention that. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, you. you're right. This is important. So now we will take, so first, thank, uh, let's thank our two speakers from the commission, Manuel and Jorge. Thank you very much for having accepted to be online and here. With great pleasure. Thank you very much. We will now have a break until four, uh, and there is an announcement just before that. Yeah, two more minutes before we go for coffee. Um, so in the context of the ECTU Alliance, there will be a science contest uh, organized in uh, October. Uh, so as you see, a science contest is a fun scientific competition um, to propose solution, best approach or explanation to scientific facts or problems and to think outside the box. So how does the contest work? There will be three teams of five researchers from different disciplines uh, that will uh, compete against each other. And they must present their answer to the audience. They will have a problem, work on it, and present their answer to the audience. So what uh, the team that organized the ECTU sign contest proposed is that you can also participate by suggesting questions that uh, teams of researchers can answer during the science contest. So basically you can scan this QR code and suggest a question uh, and the science co contest will take place at the EC2 Forum in Linz on the 23rd of October, 2024. So here's the QR code. If you want to suggest any scientific questions for our teams, you're welcome to do so. And now I invite you for coffee and a little break and we'll resume at four for the makeathon presentations yeah. thank you so at four we will actually have uh, the possibility to see again uh, the winners of our uh, talents and creativity uh, competition so stay all connected online and uh, come back in the room here at four thank you